Mm. Oh, that's a good cider. Cider Boys. Uh, Tropical Wave is what I'm drinking tonight. Which I admit is uh, perhaps not the most appropriate beer for this episode of tonight's double feature. Welcome. My name is Paul. Thank you for joining me. And um, it's cold, you know, it's cold right now. It's uh, snowing a little bit, which is concerning since I am in my basement. But uh, we're going to press on. We have two movies to talk about tonight uh, that deal with snow. Lots of snow, in fact. Um, I like snow. I think that a lot of people like snow, but it took me a while as someone who is from the Midwest and used to really not like the snow. It took me a while. You know, I moved to L.A. for six years and then I came back. And what I figured out, the key to liking snow is to just not be in it much, you know, just stay inside and you shouldn't have an issue. I got, you know, some flurries right now, but it's not too bad. So I'm very excited to talk about two movies that have lots of snow in it. Beginning with movie number one tonight, which is Dreamcatcher. And uh, this is a film that came out in 2003. I want to say 2003, possibly 2002. 2003, Dreamcatcher. Uh, and I have to be honest with you guys, there is so much snow in this movie. There really is. Um, I mean, even you can tell on the cover... Look, at it. it's just kind of a snowy, you know, uh, wonderland, really. It's not a Christmas movie. I was very careful to pick uh, movies that are wintry, that, but are not, you know, Christmas movies, because I have strict rules about that. And by the way, I do have the fire going because it is cold, but I want to be clear about this. Uh, that is not the fire from my Christmas Yule Log, okay? This is just a standard fireplace party screen or whatever you want to do with it, really. Uh, Non-holiday specific. It's okay for January. It's okay for February. I have strict rules about this. Anyway, Dreamcatcher is a film that was... Uh, this is directed by Lawrence Kasdan who is pretty, was pretty big in Hollywood for like, uh, you know, um, Empire Strikes Back and lots of big movies. And this is based on the book by Stephen King. Um, now, this is a movie that I suppose is maybe, I don't want to say controversial, but there's some people that seem to like it. There's some people that seem to hate it. And... I thought that I was in the people who like it category, but listen, I'm going to be honest. I watched this last night in preparation for tonight's episode, and I was just stunned. I was stunned at how bad this is. This movie's bad. Like, first of all, let's just talk about the cast, okay? Can you see this up here? You got Morgan Freeman... You got Thomas Jane. I can't read that. Morgan Freeman, Thomas Jane, Jason Lee, Damian Lewis, Timothy Oliphant, Tom Sizemore, and Donnie Wahlberg. Yeah, that's Mark Wahlberg's brother. Um, Dreamcatcher. This. So, if you don't know, Stephen King. Um, if I if I understand this correctly, Stephen King was in a bad car accident at some point. I believe it was a car accident and was all messed up and apparently wrote Dreamcatcher while he was all messed up and on like a ton of pain meds. And even 
he, Stephen King, has said, yeah, I'm not really sure what I was doing. I'm not sure what this, what Dreamcatcher was all about. So, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to make a good movie out of a existing book. That's a difficult thing to pull off just because of navigating the different, you know, books are a lot longer and you have to cram a lot of stuff into a movie. Difficult enough as it is. But even if the book, if Stephen King himself says that the book wasn't very good, you got a really difficult um, uphill battle, you know. But the thing about this movie is, you know, I was watching it last night. It's got it's got the great cast in it, as you just heard. And I think it has an interesting premise for like the first maybe uh, almost half of it, maybe less a little less than half of it. It's got this great premise of these childhood friends who um, all have this gift, basically, of being able to um, they're, they're like telepathic with each other. There's four friends who are telepathic with each other and they can sense when something's wrong with the other one or whatnot. You know, they have this very special bond that they all kind of acquired during their childhood because of this friend that they made um, by the name of Duddits, played by... Um, Donnie Wahlberg in this film. And that's kind of like the first half of the movie, right? But then it goes really off the rails with Morgan Freeman plays this uh, really, he's the bad guy in the movie. Morgan Freeman is the main bad guy, which is something that I don't think you see very often. Um, and to me, it just didn't really work all that well. He's a fantastic actor, obviously, but um, they transitioned from this smaller story about a group of guys uh, out in the woods at this cabin that they go to every year, right? They, it's like a traditional, uh, it's like a annual tradition that they do going out to this cabin to hunt and whatnot. There's snow all over the place, folks. Now, I'm not saying that this is a great movie, but if you want, if you're looking for a movie that has snow in it, I'm here to tell you this got a lot of snow. So they're out hunting. There's all this snow everywhere. And then um, it basically turns into a creature feature. They find this alien slug-like creature um, and they have to deal with that. Um, I won't get too deep into spoilers. If you do want to watch it, I will not spoil anything for you. But it does kind of go off the rails. And watching it last night for the first time in a handful of years, I was really disappointed. I'm like, I cannot believe how much of a mess this has turned into. Um, it, it's almost like two different movies. You have the characters at the beginning, and then you have all this military stuff going on at the end, and it just didn't work for me. And it didn't work for Stephen King either. So, I mean, if it didn't work for the guy who wrote the book, it's probably not going to work for the, you know, general movie-going public, if you will. Um... I, th I think that this effectively killed Lor Lawrence Kasdan's career for a while. He bounced back eventually um, with, you know, he did like Star Wars, um, The Force Awakens and stuff like that. So he's doing fine. He's not homeless or anything. But uh, this movie was a, a bomb and it did not do well. And I watched it again last night. I'm like, I get that. I get that. Um, but I do think it's worth checking out because it's it's a failure and it's kind of a disaster piece in an interesting way, you know? Like things are, uh, it's not boring. You're sort of watching it. You're like, what is happening here? So I do recommend checking out uh, Dreamcatcher at some point if you are interested. That is movie number one for tonight. And there is a lot of snow in Dreamcatcher, but I have to tell you, in movie number two,
folks, in movie number two, there is even more snow. It's 30 Days of Night, and this is a film... This is a film that came out in, I want to say, 2007. Let's make sure I have that right. On the back of the, you know, on the back of the box here, there's all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint. But yeah, there we go, 2007. This film came out. Did I forget to show you the back of Dreamcatcher? Just in case you want to pause that and take a look at everything on the back, at the description and the special features and all that jazz. Um, but 30 Days of Night, wow. I mean, this movie is... Uh, it's a vampire movie. We got a creature, sort of an alien creature movie, and then we have a vampire movie. So I do think that these two movies... Uh, would make for a good double feature evening. A little bit uh, of a long double feature because Dreamcatcher is over two hours long. That's part of the problem as well. 30 Days of Night is like 95 minutes or 96 minutes. So not too bad. But there is so much snow in this thing right here. Uh, I would say damn near every frame. Damn near every frame of this movie has snow and it's wonderful. The movie itself, I think, is pretty good. Um, I watched this recently for the first time. I would say maybe about a year ago I saw this movie for the first time. I had heard people talking about it. I heard heard, heard the rumblings of it, 30 Days of Night. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to check it out. I saw it streaming somewhere. And then I picked this up the other day at a local record shop for like two bucks. And I said this will make a nice little episode of uh, tonight's double feature. So it's about, um, I actually really enjoy the concept of this movie. Um, similar to how I enjoy the concept of Dreamcatcher, but I think they execute it better in this particular film. Um, it's all about the northernmost town in Alaska, uh, Barrow, I want to say it's called. It doesn't say on the back, but I believe it's called Barrow, which I think is a real town in Alaska, way up in Alaska. And there's this thing that happens where the sun goes down and it doesn't come back up for 30 days, right? So you have literally 30 days of night. Um, and that is uh, prime time for this pack of vampires to swoop into the town and basically just have a buffet. Basically just go absolutely hog wild on the townspeople that have chosen to stay, uh, pardon me, during the 30 days of night, right? So a very interesting concept in terms of trying to come up with a clever workaround for like vampires can't be out during the day. Well, let's just go to Alaska where there's no sun, and chow down, you know. Um, uh, as you can see here, it's got Josh Hartnett in it, who I am completely neutral about. Uh, have no feelings about him, him as an actor one way or another. And then another actor, Melissa George. Um... And I feel like this must have been a very early Blu-ray because see at the bottom it says experience it in high definition or just experience high definition, which I did. Um, the movie looks perfectly fine. There are some special features on the back here. So this is pretty cool. Um, Blu-ray exclusive uh, 30 images of night graphic graphic novel to film comparison. I did not realize that this was a graphic novel. Maybe some of you graphic novel uh, fans out there probably knew about that. I did not. So that's really cool. Uh, and then there's uh, eight behind the scenes featurettes on here. I will not go. Oh, Building Barrow. So there you go, Barrow, Alaska. I won't go through all of them. I will turn it around really quick if you want to pause and take a look at all of that. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed this film. I definitely think that if you haven't seen it, it is worth a watch. Um, not a classic by any means. I don't think either of these films are 
um, you know, bona fide classics or anything like that that I'm going to watch over and over again. But I am happy to have them in my collection. And let me tell you, there is so much snow in both of these movies. Um, really beautiful, actually. Um, I'm watching the movie and I'm thinking to myself, how did they pull off some of, you know, the just creating all of the snow? Obviously, there was real snow there, but I, I know that for some of it, they had to create fake snow. And that's always an interesting sort of... Um, behind the scenes thing that I that I enjoy and I appreciate. So I'll probably go back and watch some of the special features on here and see if there's any, you know, look at how they built the town or anything cool like that. Anyway, snow movies, you know, lots of snow in these two guys right here. And I do recommend that you check out both of them. I'm trying to get a good thumbnail. There we go.